Welcome everyone. My name is Stephanie Ivick. I'm the content marketing manager here at ELB Learning, formerly known as eLearning Brothers. Today we have a great session on how Michigan State University Advancement implemented game-based training. But first I'll go over a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded. We'll email a copy of the recording out to everyone who registered. You'll get that in your inbox tomorrow. Closed captions are enabled for this webinar. You can turn them on for yourself using the live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. And if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to submit those in the Q&A panel. We also have live chat turned on, so say hello, let us know where you're joining from and share your comments as the webinar goes on. Joining me today, we have Stephen Baer, Chief Creative Officer of the Game Agency, and three special guests from Michigan State University. We're very excited to have them and hear what they have to say. So without further ado, Stephen, I'll let you kick everything off. Thanks so much. Um, uh, as Stephanie said, we are talking with Michigan State University. Uh, we're working with their um, advancement uh, training and education team. We're talking about how they're using game-based training um, for both, well, primarily for remote training. Um, I'm very excited about this webinar in particular because um, when you think about uh, as a product owner and what I focus on primarily is the training arcade, um, you think about wanting to have people really embrace your product. And this story tells that story. This team has done amazing stuff. Hundreds of games, hundreds of videos, hundreds of missions, really, really exciting stuff. We're going to get really into the weeds here and talk about what's worked, what hasn't worked, and you know, try to take away lessons for each of us to be able to implement ourselves. So let's get going. Okay, so just as a quick reminder, um, many of you know me. Uh, I'm the Chief Creative Officer at the Game Agency. The Game Agency was acquired about a year ago by uh, now ELB Learning. Um, I'm wearing my new ELB Learning uh, clothing. Um, today, we officially changed the name from eLearning Brothers to ELB Learning, and um, we'll talk about more of that later. But why don't we move on and introduce uh, the people who are really the star of the shows. Adeline, do you want to introduce yourself? And we'll uh, have everyone else do the same. Yeah, sounds good. So my name is Adeline Wharton. I am a learning designer and instructor, and I've been with Michigan State University Advancement for almost eight years now. I have a Master of Arts in Technology and Education from the University of Michigan. And prior to working with MSU, I was an instructional designer in the private sector. I'm Laura Fenger. I'm a training specialist here at University Advancement. I've been here for almost two years. I'm a recovering middle school teacher and I'm a proud Spartan. And I'm Jessica Van Els. I'm a business analyst and I've been with Michigan State University Advancement for a little over two years now. I'm working on a master's degree in data science and I am a proud third generation Spartan. So for today, we're gonna to talk about a number of things. We're gonna talk about the why and how um, MSU is using games and you know, really their strategy overall. We're gonna talk about the uh, learner testimonials. Um, we're gonna go through uh, data and analytics, which is, uh, it's a great story, but I think that um, every story you probably wanna know, how does it work? So that's, uh, that's part I get really excited about. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about MSU's plans uh, for the future. Um, and we're gonna talk, different tips and tricks that they've uh, really learned that we can hopefully all uh, utilize going forward. So let's dig in. Um, just as a quick overview, for those of you who are not familiar with um, the game agency, as I mentioned, the game agency is part of ELB Learning. Uh, we build a lot of custom games. We have um, two platforms on either side of this. You can see um, we have our training arcade tool, which we're gonna be talking about today. And we also have um, Arcades and Motivate Cloud. Um, so the, the training arcade is uh, for people to build their own games, a lot of what we'll have here today, um, as well as Arcades and Motivate Cloud is where those games can be housed. Those are uh, really gamified player hubs, if you will. Okay. Michigan State University Advancement, also called UA, is responsible for fundraising and for alumni, donor, and friend engagement. UA has more than 300 staff members across the university, based both centrally and in more than 30 fundraising units. MSU has more than 500,000 living alumni across the world, and we raised more than $1.2 billion from more than a quarter million donors in the last capital campaign. And the best part is that our offices are housed in Spartan Stadium. 
So here's a little bit about our team. The mission of University Advancement Training Services Program is to provide new and current employees with a highly progressive training program that we offer based on job role, uh, courses that are applying to different learning styles while still supporting them in the workforce that is representative of our UA standards here at MSU. Um, today, we will discuss the development of our curricula, the course delivery, whether it was instructor led or online training, the design and creation of our learning support materials and our gap analysis. So prior to this project, I had minimal experience using game-based learning or gamification at university advancement before our big project to transition our customer relationship management CRM platform. Before this project, training was very traditional. It included essential training media resources, as a guide uh, while our employees attended instructor-led classes. And then we eventually transitioned part of them into online training. And all of them are still geared to each type of learner. The original plan for this project um, was for to provide lunch and learns, maybe some presentations at various department meetings. And we wanted to include weekly articles before each instructor-led training to kind of provide tips and tricks and a few micro-learning videos. But as we all know, due to COVID restrictions, we had to reevaluate our training program and we needed to find a new way to engage with our learners while they worked remotely. Thankfully, we, I had a couple conversations with one of our colleagues. He had prior experience in gamification while attending graduate school, and he provided a lot of practical insight on how we could use game-based learning within our training program. Over the last few years, University Advancement has gone through a lot of techno um, technology updates. A few years ago, we actually started building our new tool, and that meant a lot of research, design, and development for training services. We were going to need to train all of our staff on navigation within the platform, but we also needed to introduce new business policies with procedures. So we kind of looked at this project as an upgrade, uh, transitioning from a landline phone to a smartphone. The smartphone could still make phone calls, store phone numbers, access voicemails, and even use redial, just like the old version of a landline. And our goal with this project was we wanted with our new CRM for our staff to be able to go on as business as usual once each phase of their onboarding was complete. So to talk about our strategy, well, this project was really extensive and required us to create a lot of training while the tool was, be, was under construction. So over several months, we worked with different teams within our department that were working really hard to help build our new CRM. We used a lot of these opportunities to gather information on what we should cover in training and to even collect future content that we would use maybe after go live to help a little later. Creating our training curriculum during this process was somewhat of a challenge as most of you probably know if you're an instructional designer. And after careful consideration, we decided to develop a training program that would introduce the content in multiple phases. Each phase would have a theme with various characters and that we would use them throughout our entire project within our games, our documents, and videos to make everything recognizable and branded. Now, during the first phase, we released a series of 12 short 30 to 60 second, they were very fun but rough cut videos, we called them our teasers, um, that provided very basic navigation. We called this series uh, Six Degrees of Training Services and it's where we delivered all of our information by a news broadcaster. And he was interviewing two police officers, myself and Laura, and we were investigating the current state of our CRM. We wanted our staff to know that we weren't just sitting here waiting, we were doing something. And these were optional videos for our staff to watch, but it gave them a little bit of insight as to what to expect in the next phase. So, the second phase, that's what we called our pre-onboarding phase. And this is where we used our training arcade. And so we created 15 journeys over 10 weeks where our users had access to our quick reference guides, our micro learning videos, and they even had optional uh, games and assessments that they can use. 
And so this phase was by far the biggest project and will provide a lot of training for all of our staff. And so Laura and I and our team, we wanted to make this really fun for them. I had the opportunity to work with a couple colleagues at the University of Utah and here at University Advancement, our marketing team. And I wanted to leverage some of their creative ideas and how we can incorporate some of these fun elements into our training. And so at this point, we continue to create cartoon characters that for this series was back to school tour guides, what we call William and Wilma Spartan. And we wanted to let our staff know that these were people that were going to be there to help them along the way, to guide them. So during this phase, we created our asynchronous learning opportunity that would provide all of our end users the freedom to manage their own learning schedule. Our fundraisers and engagement officers are on the road. So the journey feature within the arcade provided a clear cut learning path that included a series of checkpoints and it honestly helped them guide them through a particular topic or series of topics. The pre-onboarding program, though, was designed to provide repeated uh, exposure to the content that was created in a layered curriculum over a series of weeks. And so, for example, each week, the content provided would build upon the previous session to help expand their knowledge base. So that was one of our main goals. In this phase, and Laura will dive a little bit deeper into it, and so will Jessica, we actually had three learning options for them to complete um, their training for pre-onboarding. They could go to the training arcade journey with games. They can do it without games. And then we also, also offered them a third option using our learning management system with uh, quizzes rather than games as an assessment. And so the learning materials that were provided were the exact same between all three paths. The only difference was the presence of the format of our formative assessment. So for us, this was really helpful because we were able to monitor the progress and to identify any gaps or areas of interest for additional learning options during this phase, as well as our um, hopefully through our onboarding phase. So in our third phase, as you can see, that's where we dive into onboarding. Now that consisted of virtual synchronous classes that were running for four months. We were still in the middle of COVID. So we had to put together a bunch of classes to make it easier for them to learn. And so we taught six lessons over this period. Uh, three were required lessons for all employees. And then there were three additional required lessons for our fundraisers, engagement officers, and some of our support staff. And Kind of like as we designed this, we reviewed our pre-onboarding data to identify any gaps that we may need to cover while working closely with our subject matter experts, because we wanted to ensure that we covered the content that all of our staff would need at Go Live, because it was going to be a hard shut off with our current environment. And the content actually was quite broad. We it ranged from basic navigation to advanced navigation. We included terms, whether they were new terms or translated terms from an old term. And then we also included business rules this time, but a little bit more in depth. And all of this content was actually covered in the pre-onboarding phase. We just cut back a lot of the content in onboarding that we didn't feel was necessary. And so while we designed this phase, we changed our theme instead of focusing on our tour guides to focus on our new character, Wayward Winnie and she would represent our staff. We wanted to show them that, you know what, you weren't the only one lost and your tour guides, William and Willow, will be there to help you along the way. So that part of the phase is there, but now we have to get into scheduling the training. And this is where it became a little bit more complicated. We wanted to make sure that we were a little bit more learner focused. And so when it came time to schedule the training sessions, we wanted to teach each lesson over two to three week time frame that would provide two sessions a day and allow for schedule changes. Our staff needed some flexibility due to their day-to-day -day role. And so we needed to give them options for schedule changes. Each class, uh, we kept it kind of small. So it was between 10 to 15 learners per class. We felt that it was uh, able to provide better support during this lesson, as well as the breakout rooms. 
We also made sure to include our subject matter experts. Um, they were there for every single lesson. We had one or two that were available and they were there to kind of help answer any questions that Laura or myself were unable to answer or maybe they needed a little bit more detail. And we also included our IT and that was huge because they helped to verify their security to the environment. They helped us with logging in our tools helping identify maybe if there was an issue that we found during training and so much more. So it was really great to have additional staff in there to help Laura and I make it through this process. And so after this training, we still needed to do a little bit work. So after each session, we would review our training notes, polling question results and breakout room content to determine whether or not we needed to adjust our training resources for the next class. We did that for every single session for four months straight. Now, these types of improvements actually really did help us and it helped prepare us for our post onboarding, which is the next phase. And we feel like it, it actually helped improve the overall training experience for our learners. So we're in our final phase so far uh, for this four phase project. And this is what our post onboarding was like. So we were providing in this phase, asynchronous and synchronous learning opportunities. And this is where we're offering additional support through maybe some small group uh, experiences. We're still providing games and we're still creating a ton of micro learning videos. And weekly, we actually meet with a couple groups uh, to work with them in the CRM using the content that we've uh, identified as useful for our go live and even content that may need to be addressed a little bit more in depth. So we're really focusing on their needs and helping them prepare for the hard shutoff. And so at this point, our learners have completed all of their required training and their learning journeys and are now back to work and preparing for go live. And so our new theme is that they all went back to Advancement City. And this is where training services become superheroes. So Laura and I turned ourselves into superheroes to make it fun. And um, we used the opportunity to create comic book style micro learning videos. And they, can, they contain a lot of the uh, information that we gathered for uh, post onboarding from our gap analysis and pre and onboarding. And Laura and I are there to save the day. We're here to help Wayward Winnie, who is now back to work, and the citizens of Advancement City from the evil villain Confusing Cole. And you can see him creeping around in the background. Um, his primary role was to try and confuse our staff. And so training services, we couldn't have that happen. And we wanted to make sure that we cleared up any potential confusion that our staff might have uh, with our previous content. Okay, and this was all gathered from our gap analysis. And as we move forward, we are gonna continue to evaluate our content and determine if we're going to need any more training moving forward. Our goal for each phase is to allow long-term absorption into the material and multiple learning opportunities for our individual navigation. And this is to help additional, uh, help any answer any additional questions. So game-based learning provided um, a remote asynchronous learning opportunity that helped our employees stay motivated and engaged and included a lot of relevant information like real life scenarios and practice with immediate feedback. We knew that it would be essential to provide the learning opportunity to engage our employees as they work remotely. And so working from home was a huge change for university advancement staff. And it was important for us to try and make it fun. And we felt that game-based learning helped our staff learn the new content and then apply what they have learned in a practice environment while still having fun and competing with their colleagues, especially using they loved the quick uh, challenges. We figured and we felt that using the games within each journey as a form of assessment allowed us to create and monitor our layered curriculum a lot closer. But it also identified a lot of knowledge gaps that we may need to adjust um, while playing games such as Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. Overall, our learners felt that the daily incentives were a nice motivator to log into the training arcade, gain a few extra points and even play some games. And so we continue to create optional post onboarding learning opportunities while still using the training arcade. 
because we wanted them to still have fun. So at the beginning of the project, we wanted to provide a lot of exciting things. And as you can tell so far, we really did. And we enjoyed ourselves. And I hope they, we know they did, uh, to onboard our staff as they embarked on this year-long journey. But before we can get started, we actually had to create a team that would help create microlearning videos, games, graphics, and documents. And during COVID, it wasn't that easy, but we were lucky enough to find a few colleagues here in University Advancement uh, from several departments that were able to help us with our audio and managing of our videos. We were also lucky to be able to hire several students that were able to work with us in graphic design and they helped create videos and there's so many things we can't even list them off what they've done. So one of the things that we did was as a motivator for pre onboarding and onboarding, we wanted to give them some cool swag so our learners could win prizes from uh, either vendors or multiple colleges and even leadership for helping us. They provided us with some cool stuff. And it was all for basic tasks, you know, ranging from signing up from training, answering questions correctly, providing us some, you know, feedback on what we're giving them for learning. And so we wanted to make sure that they were inter entertaining. And so we created one of the themes was considered the Fast and the Furious, and it included a car coaster, an MSU license plate, and a nice keychain. Um, during the entire project, we used characters at some point for our news articles with uh, memes or even videos. We felt like the news articles were the best ways to communicate with our staff. At some point, we decided to thank everyone because it was a huge team undertaking. And so we turned our, the, our Willow and William into cookies as a thank you. And all along the way, we had to use our new database. And so we wanted to continue introducing our characters. And so what we did one night at SUA social hours, we cartoonized everyone. We turned them into cartoon. And as you can see, Jessica makes a really cute cartoon. And then lastly, when it came to using our CRM, we needed to make sure that our content was, you know, somewhat realistic. It was really important for us, but we also wanted to make it dramatic and entertaining. So it was eye-opening when they walked in there. And for example, we used a lot of recognizable characters for our learners, such as like Paddington Bear, G.I. Joe, G.I. Jane, and my personal favorite, Gem Hologram. And so the majority of our staff actually enjoyed using them during training, which was very entertaining. And even to this day, I'm still receiving messages from our new staff that are taking the classes online, telling me that they're still happy to see that Gem Hologram works for Starlight Music. So during this uh, program, we have created quite a number of different training materials. We created 119 documents and 166 videos to date. Adeline created the documents, and then we had MSU students who created the videos. We also did have several staff members who helped out with editing, audio recording, things like that. Now, these documents were used throughout the training as reference guides, and I often included an image of the guide when asking a question in the game. This helped with the learning because the user was asked the question and then immediately had the document image to refer to when looking for the answer. We've also created 170 games so far. Um, these were used in training both uh, how to use the training arcade and the, during the pre-onboarding, as well as during the onboarding and now during post-onboarding. The games included videos and images along with multiple choice questions, which helped users to start making connections between the documents, the videos, and our new CRM. Now, during the journey phase, I did add a few standalone games for users to access that would help reinforce the previous content and quite honestly, to try to keep up with the power players who played the games in the journeys repeatedly and wanted something new. Now, during the onboarding phase, I created some specific games for each lesson that we taught. And these games reviewed the content involved in that particular lesson, again, reinforcing the content for the users. I also created 30 journeys for the pre-onboarding phase. 15 of them had games and 15 of them did not have games. And I loaded those one or two at a time over a period of 10 weeks last summer. We did carry the hiking mountain theme throughout the games, the videos, and the journeys. 
These allowed us to take the learner through a series of activities. So each journey had a series of checkpoints, and then these checkpoints had multiple activities. Users had to complete the activities in order and then complete the checkpoints in order. And by utilizing these journeys, we were able to ensure that users saw the content in the correct order. So many times the user would open the document, watch the video, and then play the game. And this meant they were better prepared to answer the questions that came up during the games. Each week as I loaded the new journeys, I used the timer feature to set them as live at 8 a.m. Monday mornings. This was helpful because they just automatically went live. I didn't have to try to remember to do it first thing Monday morning when I'm not terribly awake. And I also used the timer to remove games or journeys once time was over. And so that automatic feature was really helpful in this process. And finally, I created 24 missions so far. Um, these are loaded on an as needed basis during the onboarding and then during our post onboarding phases. So we switched over to missions when the onboarding phase began. Now the difference between a mission and a journey is that a journey is um, a journey has to have multiple activities and stages, but a mission can have just one activity. In our case, we still did have missions with more than one activity, but they don't include the videos or the documents. And by using a mission, I can make sure that if I have a series of games, users are completing them in the order that would follow a progression. Now, this is what the dashboard looks like for the end user. So when they log on, they see this. Um, as you can see, there's a spin to win wheel, which can give free points or no points. That's always kind of disappointing when you get the no prize. <laughs> um, each of the tiles below can be a game, a mission, a journey, a task, things like that. And the nice thing is you can list a featured game or two at the top to draw the user's attention to them. And then the leaderboard, which is very popular among our users, can show up to 10 users for the global leaderboard. And then over on the left, you've got a navigation tree that lets you see your achievements, what your level is, and then any prizes that you can win. Now, this is the view of the journey that the end user sees. So as you can see, you have to complete the first stage before you can unlock stage two. And the number of stages that you put there can vary depending on your needs. So you could have um, fewer stages if you wanted than what I have here, but each journey does have to contain two or more stages. And then this is a view of a mission. So you can have just one activity in a mission if you like. As you can see in this particular mission, it has three games. And so this was nice because the user then completed the games in a set order that would make the most sense. Now we used almost all of the games and features at some point in the training because we made a lot of <laughs> materials. Um, the ones that we used the most include the journeys and the missions, and then those used trivia, Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune, Sort It, and scenarios primarily. Now journeys are nice because they help to guide the learner through the lessons, and each journey involves someone watching a video, reviewing a document, and then playing a game. And each journey, we also had to end with a fun congratulations video just to kind of let them know that the journey was complete. Now, once the synchronous learning was completed, staff members were given missions to complete within the arcade. And these missions included various games, which would help them practice what they had been learning. And so we were able to um, organize the games for the staff and help them to continue their learning asynchronously. Now, trivia was helpful with learning new terminology and basic navigation. And I was able to have each game directly connected to the microlearning video and the quick reference guides. Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune also helped with the new terminology and basic navigation. But because they're well-known games, users tended to see them as more fun than the basic trivia game. Now, the Sort It game was useful when learners needed to differentiate between concepts and terms within the CRM because it required both analysis and synthesis of the content. And then the scenarios game came into play once the staff was able to access the test environment. We used the scenarios to give them real world experience using the new CRM as they practiced what they had learned. And as Sparty says, who doesn't like games? They are great on a number of different levels. 
First, they allow you to guide the user through an independent learning process. The game structure can be set up to ask easier questions, progressing to harder, or you can divide the content into sections based on the questions. And this allows you to help the user navigate the content in the way that will create the most connections between those pieces of information. And the training arcade was especially helpful because it allowed me to create that series of games or activities and help the user navigate. Now, games also allow for the story to continue throughout, including the types of images and characters that we used in the videos gave a cohesiveness to the learning. You can also tell a story within the game using information cards between questions. This can help users stay entertained and also create emotions. Next, you, um, games can be used to teach asynchronously as well as assess the learning process. So by using the information card option between questions, I could use that to instruct the users. And by adding an image, a text, or a video, this can be an effective way to include instruction along the way. And once they had a chance to look at that, then I'd ask a question related to it. I was also able to leverage the information card option to give them a task within the CRM and then ask a question about the task. And finally, games offer a more enjoyable learning experience and they add fun to the process. Because they see it as playing games, they would often go back and replay the game multiple times. And trust me, this kind of repeat play does not happen very often with a traditional assessment. Now, in terms of the most um, effective or the popular games, Wheel of Fortune was often mentioned as a favorite. Uh, users found it more fun than some of the other games. It also was a newer addition to our arcade because it came out after we had started. And so they liked the, the change up there. And that kind of indicates that it is a good idea to use different games to keep the interest level higher. Now, Scenarios was an excellent way to provide teaching as well as assessment in one game. And it also allows for review of a topic easily. So if um, users select the wrong answer, I can send them to a review slide and then loop them back to the original question for another shot at it. And finally, Trivia was a quick game to create, which allowed me to set up a game last minute whenever it was needed. And I found that by removing the time limits, I could include questions that would require the user to search for information within the CRM and then answer a question about it. And this allowed me to use the Trivia game for more than just testing basic facts. Now, while users did love playing the games and they really felt that this training plan helped to prepare them for our launch date, as you can see here, there were a few things they ran into that are gonna be helpful to take into account. One challenge that the users experienced was with the text input answers. If they worded something differently than the options offered, it was considered incorrect, even though the content was correct. Also, we found people who aren't good spellers tend to struggle more with Wheel of Fortune. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, the Sort It game requires users to decide which item goes in which row and column. So they do have to use a lot of analysis and synthesis. And that game made them think more, but it didn't feel as fun to the end user. And we also found that time limits on the questions in any of the games did make some users anxious because they felt rushed. However, Overall, I would say users definitely seem to really enjoy playing the games. And I got a lot of comments like, I can't believe I get to play games for work. Now, as you create your own arcade or games, I do have a few suggestions. And some of these I learned the hard way. Um, first, it's a good idea to complete each journey as you launch it. That way you can go in and easily um, go to any of the activities within it when a user has a question or needs navigation assistance. Next, I recommend that you play each game as you build it and check the images before launching it. Sometimes they can look different when you're actually playing the game versus building it. Also, as you play the game, look for typos because they creep in way too easily. It's also a good idea to have a couple of users who can test your game for you. Um, fresh eyes can catch problems or badly worded sentences. And then we recommend making use of the analytics on each game. If a lot of people are getting a question wrong, you can look and see if the question is badly worded, or maybe you just need to add an information slide prior to the question. 
And like I said earlier, text input questions can be tricky. If a user uses an abbreviation or a spelling error or rearranges how they word it, then the answer can look like it's wrong and they don't like that. Also, it's a good idea to use the optional feedback feature. Um, that way you can either give the correct answer when they get it wrong, or you can suggest where they can look to find the correct answer. And then I do recommend that you make use of the prize feature because people like to win stuff. You also will want to organize the activities on the dashboard so that they make sense and have kind of a flow and create titles that will indicate what the user will be learning. That makes everything easier. Um, I also recommend that you plan time to train the users within the arcade. Some users are into games and they'll figure it out, but some people will feel uncomfortable using new technology and so a little guidance can help. And then as you build your games, think about the questions as a progression. So work up to the harder questions. You can also use images to allow the user to be more successful. So sometimes I might put an image that answered the question as part of the um, question. So it's right there on the screen. So users who are struggling a bit could feel success. And then as the game moves on, you can pull that support back to give more of a challenge. And finally, carefully consider whether or even when to use time limits on the questions. Some people like the thrill of beating the clock, but others mentioned that they were really stressed over having that time limit. Overall, there was a lot of great data, including metrics and reports in the training arcade to show user progress and information or attention. However, the next few slides are gonna focus on reports and conclusions that we've synthesized outside of these prepared dashboards. For management, we were primarily interested in high level reports of completion. After each week of pre-onboarding and each lesson of onboarding, I sent out a report looking at user participation and engagement. After the onboarding lessons were over, we also did an impact analysis of how interaction with pre-onboarding influenced employees' accuracy and information retention in onboarding formative assessments. The training services team used the results from pre-onboarding and onboarding assessments to identify gaps in employees' knowledge. For example, we found that they were struggling more with new concepts rather than concepts which were translated from the existing system. To address this, Training Services is focusing on putting these concepts and terms into the post op onboarding phase games. In the future, we also plan to do a more detailed analysis of how the formatting of questions and the games utilized impacted user performance across all training phases. For example, we know that they struggled a little bit with Sort It, but liked Trivia and Wheel of Fortune, and we want to know if that is reflected in the accuracy and information retention metrics. To complete all of these analyses, we are combining multiple data sources. This includes a staff list, which has information about each staff member's job role and reporting lines, data from the training arcade, especially the journey and game reports from pre-onboarding and onboarding, data from our LMS for pre-onboarding and onboarding, and data from Zoom polls, Microsoft Forms, and CRM reports, which we used for polls and breakout rooms and the onboarding classes. I use statistical analysis software in order to combine and clean up the data across these many sources. Across our 15 onboarding journeys, pre-onboarding journeys, at least 80% of users completed each journey. We had three types of journeys in pre-onboarding, all had the same learning materials. The arcade green was the version in the arcade with games, arcade white had no games, and the LMS had quizzes rather than games. And at least one third of all users completed each pre-onboarding journey with games. And we had two users who played some of the game journeys more than 20 times each. In total, 217 out of about 300 users completed at least one journey with games multiple times. In comparison, no one went through the version of the journey in the LMS more than once. We also found that users were highly engaged with the leaderboard in the arcade, and many went through the version of the journeys without games many times in order to earn points. This behavior went on without any external encouragement. It wasn't until later that we decided to reward this behavior and it was solely competitive. Um, as a note, before I go into the next section, each of the six onboarding lessons had between three and six related pre-onboarding journeys, looking at the terminology and navigation um, that people would see in the onboarding class. So in general, users who completed pre-onboarding in any format 
had better results on their formative assessments in the corresponding onboarding lesson than those who did not. The table is showing the difference in assessment performance during onboarding for those who completed all of the associated pre-onboarding versus those who did not complete all of the associated pre-onboarding. The four lessons I'm showing um, were the most complex, focusing on philanthropic giving data and prospect management data, two of the key pillars of advancement. Polls were designed to be quick knowledge checks, while breakout rooms were more advanced, focusing on navigating to find information in the CRM or on completing simulated tasks. Users who completed pre-onboarding performed between 0.3 and 5.5 percentage points better on polls, and users who completed pre-onboarding performed between 2 and 5 percentage points better on breakout rooms. Lessons 4 and 5, Prospect Basic and Advanced, focus the most heavily on business application and daily tasks. Users who had completed the pre-onboarding performed performed much better on the breakout room formative assessments for these lessons, which involved entering data into the system as they would in their day-to-day job. We have concluded that the users who completed pre-onboarding had better experience understanding the navigation because of their engagement in pre-onboarding, and so therefore they were better able to focus on learning business rules and application rather than learning basic navigation, and so they performed better on the assessments. We can also look more specifically at the impact of assessment-based pre-onboarding on onboarding performance. Here, assessment-based learning means going through pre-onboarding in the arcade version with games or through the LMS, which had quizzes. However, we do know that engagement in the arcade with games um, was consistently at least double the engagement with the LMS. Here, we're focusing on the three lessons, which were specifically designed for fundraising engagement and some support staff. This table is showing the positive impact of consistent engagement with assessment-based learning. On the left side, we see the results for those who completed assessments for all of the pre-onboarding journeys associated with each of the three lessons. They're performing between two and three percentage points better than those who only did assessment-based pre-onboarding for none or some of the pre-onboarding journeys with that lesson. On the right-hand side, we're looking at the, those who completed assessments for any of the pre-onboarding journeys associated with the lesson. And those people are also generally performing better than those who did not do any game or assessment-based learning in pre-onboarding. So a few last ideas to help with your training plan. First, uh, you, less content is suggested. Spread it out over a longer period of time. This can keep your users from feeling overwhelmed. Next, differentiate the content that you need to cover with what you want to cover. Again, it can be easy to overdo the content. We also recommend that you allow yourself time to learn the system before you need to create games. As with any new software, there is a learning curve. So plan some time to work within the system and get a feel for how to create the games. Also consider whether you can create different style games with the same content to help a variety of learners. And it's a good idea to try to tell a story in your game. It makes it a little more fun for the learner. And review the questions with the answers to determine the best format. Some content fits with certain games better than others. And finally, the game info section includes an information pop-up. And because this pops up at the beginning of the game for the user, it's a good spot to include a link to a website they might need or any special instructions that might be helpful. So the thing about UA is we are one big team and this project took a lot of people and we had a ton of ups and downs. And one of the biggest things is we were very thankful that we had the support of our leadership. Uh, It was truly critical to the success of our implementation of our onboarding as with any new product or business process to have the buy-in and support of our leadership. It was important for us to have that strong backing for the innovation that guides and lifts our staff to excellence in their day-to-day tasks. And this has been really pivotal to our success. But our success was also because of our relationship with our IT staff and our subject matter experts. We could not have been as successful in our program at all without their knowledge, their constant support, and above all, their patience. Here are some, but not all of the tools that we use during this project. 
So Beyond was used by the training services team for graphics, cartoonization, and micro learning videos. Both the training arcade and the LMS were used throughout this project for pre-onboarding and onboarding. And I used R and Tableau for data cleaning and visualization. So let's jump into questions. There's a lot of really amazing stuff here. First of all, I want to just thank again um, our friends from MSU for presenting because this is, in my mind, a best case scenario. This is you guys went above and beyond. And over the last year, you guys have dug in not just building lots of games, but building a really comprehensive strategy, um, thinking about your content, thinking about uh, um, you know, how to engage learners, how to A-B test, how to um, reward learners, how to keep them coming back and then rejiggering and making it better along the way. And I think that this is, uh, I, I imagine most people who listen today join me in thinking this is um, what we all want to be creating when we have the opportunity. So um, hats off to us for doing so. Um, why don't we open up, uh, you know, for some Q&A. Why don't we, I suggest we start with some questions specifically about um, what MSU has done and what's worked and what hasn't and specifics. And we can go from there. All right. Thank you all. We are getting some great comments in the chat about what great information this was and how cool everything you made looked. We do have a question for MSU. How did you address confidentiality and proprietary knowledge with using the Training Arcade as a third party vendor? Well, that was actually where we created our own records. And so we invented our own people that would go into our test database, such as GI Joe, GI Jane, and Gem Hologram. We wanted to make it as shocking as possible that everyone would actually know who they were. So that's kind of how we managed that and created fake records. Okay, thank you. And what was the registration process for the people taking the training? Do you mean the registration process in the training arcade or in the instructor-led course? Uh, that's a good question. They don't specify, but probably in the training arcade. Well, we used a single sign-on, so that is one of the options that the training arcade offers, so that they were using single sign-on for several of our other areas on campus as well, so they just simply logged in with their um, email and password. Okay. Stephen, do you want to pop in and just mention other ways that people could do it through the training arcade? Yeah, so there are a few things. Um, when it comes to registration, um, a single sign-on is, I think, a really important component, right? Because most, in most instances, people already have other platforms they're using. And as you could see from the, you know, the data that Jessica talked about, um, you, you want to make sure that you're looking holistically at the user experience. Um, that said, um, if you are just using the training arcade on its own, um, you can really, uh, from a registration standpoint, you can have any fields that you want, right? So you have the default fields and you can create any custom fields that you want to um, track a, you know, an individual, whether it you know, is by geography or role or, you know, um, or, or, or you know, uh, table number, whatever it is, right? Like the, the point is we want to make sure that you're getting the data that you need, so. Perfect, thank you. And are the journeys and missions set up sequentially? Like, do you have to complete one before you can go to the next one? The each journey is, now you could complete journey three before you complete journey one, but within the journey, you have to do the stages um, one after another. And the same thing with the missions, you can jump around among missions, but if you're within a mission, if you have more than one activity, it's, it's in a specified order. Okay, thank you. And let's see, we've got, um, all right. So how did the handoff or division of labor, labor work between the content in the training arcade and the content in the LMS? Um, so basically, I, I created in, you know, all of the content, and then I just simply loaded it to each. So we, we actually, because we had three paths, but they were all the same content, I simply created a, an, a journey with games, 
And then I created that same journey, but I didn't load the games. And then I also created the quizzes and content in the LMS. So I just kind of did the same. I did a lot of copy and paste. <laughs> copy and pasting, the secret to success everywhere, right? <laughs> yes. Okay, I think this is a question more for Stephen. The games in the training arcade, are these Section 508 ADA compliant? They are not. Um, that is a question that we get often asked, and um, it's something I wish that we could tackle. And there are some, you know, games that uh, certainly take into account accessibility issues uh, in a, you know, uh, more effective form than others. So, you know, I would say that our uh, trivia game uh, does, uh, I would say that there's probably of the 10 games, you know, three or four that are um, check off a lot of the boxes, but none of them are co completely 508 compliant. Um, that's a real big challenge with games. Um, you know, the, when you think about a game, um, you know, especially when you think about the games that we have, uh, there are different triggers you can turn on or off, right? So there's things, um, you know, anyway, whether it's speed, whether it is audio and some of the, uh, you know, some of the tension that is attached with that, some of the color, um, you know, functionality where you need to keep in, keep in mind, um, you know, different accessibility issues. And there's, there's dozens of things you need to keep in mind. And unfortunately, um, games really fight uh, those requirements to a certain degree because of, in essence, what they are, right? Yes, definitely. It's always a struggle. We want to be fun, but we want to be compliant. It's tough. Uh, question for the team from MSU. Can you tell us about how long it took you to create a single game? What was that experience like? Um, Getting near the end. <laughs> <laughs> well, and to be honest, it depends on which game you're talking about. Um, putting together a trivia game, I could knock one out in five minutes because it's just question, answer, question, answer. The scenarios, um, because I did, usually with the scenarios, what I did is I gave a scenario, gave a question, and then depending, you know, if they got the wrong answer, then I sent them to a review, quest, review slide and then back to that question. So that took quite a bit to get all that sorted out and make sure they were all pointing to the right slides and all of that sort of thing. So. Um, probably a simple scenario game, we'd be looking at maybe a half hour, 45 minutes, once you get rolling, I mean, not your first time. <laughs> yes, definitely. Practice makes perfect. Um, shameless plug here. I will mention that starting next week, we're going to have a webinar series where we pick one game from the training arcade and we build it live on a webinar. Ooh, and attend the, those webinars because you want <laughs> yes, that kind of thing. It's going <laughs> to be great. You'll see exactly how to do it, like step by step. And I promise we can complete it within one webinar. So Ooh. yes. Okay. Sign up for those. I'll, I'll be signing up for those. Where do we <laughs> sign up for those? Uh, you can sign up for it when I send out our newsletter on Thursday, and it'll also be on our website probably tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that. It's also worth mentioning, by the way, for any subscribers of the Training Arcade, one of the things that our customer success team tries to do is um, schedule times with subscribers to help them think through how to build games and not just the ins and out of the mechanics of building, but the strategy behind it. So what are your learning objectives? What are you trying to accomplish? What performance um, you know, objectives do you have and what are the right games to use? Um, and what, what might go into that from an instructional design perspective? So if there are any subscribers of the Trinity Arcade who would like that type of support, uh, that, that is something that, you know, within, within a few, you know, few sessions we offer as a free service. And if you want more than that, we, you know, we charge for that. But it's, I think, a great thing for uh, people to, to utilize and, and I encourage anyone to do. Yes, we are always here to support you. We have um, one last question for the MSU team. What are the future plans for updates and for new employees as they join the team? Well, right now we transitioned our onboarding classes to online, but we are offering group learning sessions using the games um, in the training arcade. It's a great way to track uh, any issues. We are also using reports, but for new staff, Right now, they're using it for their onboarding and post-onboarding, kind of just a filler until we're ready to go live. And once we go live, 
pretty much we're going to use what we've learned through all of those phases to determine the best needs that we have that we have to address and any changes. Things change in technology. We all know that, right? Always. Things are always changing. Um, I will note we've gotten this question in other webinars before. If you make changes to a game that's already been published, those changes will automatically be made. You don't need to put a new URL anywhere. So that is kind of a nice feature. If you have a lot of games already made and you're changing them after the fact, the URLs stay the same. So I when you go in and fix those typos. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, there's always some typos that sneak past. Oh, okay. All right. We have one. We're going to take this one last question for the MSU team, and then I think we'll be out of time. Can the team please talk about the role that communications played in helping ensure signups and attendance? Like, was there a series of emails? Um, how did you communicate with people? What did you feel worked the best to in drive adoption of this? Well, one of our biggest communicators was our marketing communications team. Uh, we had a group of people that really, we leveraged them in every area that we possibly could. Um, we met weekly in preparation for pre-onboarding, while we were onboarding, even in pre, uh, every phase, literally, we were meeting weekly, trying to make sure we can get to them. Because in COVID, the only option you have is an email, but let's be honest, we're all emailing. And so we, they provided uh, communications in a lot of group meetings. Um, management was involved. Our leaderships were continuously uh, getting their staff involved and saying, hey, we need you to move this down the line and make sure everyone knows you need to do X, Y, and Z. And so it was really helpful to have our communication team and our leadership. As far as what the best one there really wasn't one that was overall the best experience. We did find that a lot more people uh, paid more attention when it was in our main, like all staff meetings or our rather uh, large job role meetings that we would have where everyone, and then all of a sudden, Laura and I would be overwhelmed with Teams messages or Zoom messages while we're in the meeting and even emails. So between that and marketing communications, those were our two best ways to communicate to our staff. Awesome, thank you for that. Now, as you can all see on the screen, these are our presenters' contact info. So if you come up with questions afterwards and you just desperately need to know how they did something or what worked best, you can reach out to them through this. And in the chat, I am going to post a link to sign up for a free trial of the Training Arcade, where you too can experience how easy it is to make a game. And you can check out all the different game options that we have there. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time today. We are getting amazing feedback in the chat about this content and how impressed everyone is with your training program, what you built, what great presentation this was. So we really appreciate you taking the time to present to us. And for all of our attendees, thank you so much for joining us. And we hope to see you all on another webinar soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys. Go thank green. You. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. <laughs>